Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Zarnett. I am the Director of Research and Strategy here at Starts With Me. Uh, I'm also a political scientist by training. I teach at the University of Toronto courses on human rights and security and a whole host of other political topics. Um, and I work closely with students, many of whom struggle with mental health. So it's a, a real pleasure to be here and to contribute to Starts With Me and to hopefully empower you, the listener, to take action, to take responsibility, to enhance your own capacity for well-being. So it's a real honor uh, to be here, and I hope you get a lot out of this conversation. Thank you, David. Okay, so we are going to, I know at the end of the last podcast with Dr. Mate, where I, rec I published my interaction with him, I said I would follow up with a commentary on it. And I thought it would be more interesting and enlightening to have David participate in that. So we are going to watch the video and we're going to pause and we are going to discuss sort of some of the psychological and psychotherapeutic interaction happening between myself and Dr. Mate. And we're going to just have a conversation about it. I think it'll be super interesting for everybody. So let me just queue it up here. And and I'm just going to roll it. Ready to go, Dave? Yeah, already. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Like addiction. And those defenses, of course, have created more problems. But they're not wrong to have developed those defenses. It's the only thing they could have done as kids. So, it's, so in other words, to be compassionate towards yourself and towards every aspect of yourself. The inquiry has to do with how we ask questions. And we ask questions to help people realize what's underneath their so-called dysfunctions. That in a nutshell is compassion inquiry. And I'm, so now if you want to put questions to me about it, I'm happy to take them. I'm also happy to work with people if anybody wants that online here. If there's any problem, you want me to work with you. If you're open enough to doing so online in front of 82 strangers from all over the world, why not, you know? But, but that depends on the individual. So uh, um, I can work with this any way you want. We can start with your questions, perhaps, if you like. But if somebody really would like the work and we can demonstrate it, then, of course, they can be a teacher to the rest of the group. Mike Stroh, you have um, raised your hand, so to speak. So go ahead. All okay. right, let's but, pause it there. Yeah. Yeah, so, Mike, I was, you know, to what I, I don't know the extent to which the the listeners will know who Gabor Mate is, um, and how common it is for therapists of of his standing to do things like this. So, I was wondering if you can just give, to the extent that you can, a, a bit of an overview. Who is Gabor Mate? Why is he popular? Um, what drew you to him? Maybe you can give us a bit of the backstory before we dig into the conversation you have with him. Yeah, that is a great question. So Gabor Mate is a, I'm going to read a bit of his bio here, to be easier, a renowned speaker, best-selling author, and he has uh, expertise in a range of topics, including addiction, stress, childhood development. He's a physician by trade. So he, I know he did, he delivered babies. A lot of the time he was a family physician, palliative care. And then he spent a decade working uh, on in downtown Vancouver on the east side, which if anyone is aware of what goes on in downtown Vancouver on Hastings Street, mm. it, 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 it's hard to believe that that's going on in a country like Canada. I just, I remember the first time I drove through there and it was a, quite a shock. Um, there's a ton of homelessness, people shooting heroin, smoking crack, like all kinds of things right out in the open. Mm. And in Vancouver, it sits on the backdrop of the most majestic mountains, you know, that you can kind of imagine. And so it's this really strange paradox. So anyway, he developed quite a quite notoriety from his work there. And he wrote a really famous book in the realm of hungry ghosts about addiction. And so he's He's sort of a world, I would say, a world expert on a lot of these things. And I think he's published 10 best-selling books 
on a whole bunch of different topics. And I like him a lot because he does have the a more mindfulness, mind, body, philosophical kind of Eastern approach. I could say Eastern, I don't know if that's even right anymore, but approach to human suffering. And it is in direct contrast to the Western highly medical problem solution, you know, write a prescription, fix the, you know, whatever it is. So that's a bit about him. So that was the first part, I guess, about him. Uh, and then you asked me what drew me to him or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I guess which I sort of answered. And then the, the rebel wisdom community that brought him in, uh, they make documentary films and they do a lot of this type of stuff in big groups and in the COVID world and in my own spiritual development, you could say, I am also seeking out other groups where I can practice and learn. Mm -hmm. And so that's what drew me to the rebel wisdom community. I think they're pretty awesome. They bring in a lot of great teachers like Gabor, um, to do these things. And so then as we were sitting there and he poses the question, you know, I could work with somebody. I wasn't expecting that. And then of course it was pure crickets because I would say, and he, he mentioned it, if anyone's open enough and, and sort of willing enough to work honestly and openly in front of a bunch of strangers, I invite you to do that. And I would say, because I have so much experience being open in front of strangers and talking about these things, uh, I was, I had no inhibition or I wasn't sort of, yeah. And so then I, I love working with great teachers. It's just such an incredible opportunity. Here's one of the world's leading teachers of, on this kind of stuff. Uh, and so I was just thought to myself, wow, I better jump in there. So Mike, it's funny because the second question I was going to, I was going to ask when I was, I guess, watching in preparation for this was why did you raise your hand? How did you feel? Were you nervous? Is this something that you felt totally comfortable with? Do you remember your emotions? Were, was there any sense of like dread, um, potential embarrassment at what you might say or were you just, you know, you've told your story a lot. You're, you're now a, a practicing therapist. You've spoken in front, in front of thousands of people. Did it feel just really natural and something um, obvious that you should do? It did. It did, particularly when nobody was speaking up. <laughs> I just thought, okay, I, I often wrestle with this. I'm, I'm going to pause and let the next few minutes roll because I think that will help introduce. Right. So, yeah, I think because no one else was, was jumping in there, that was the invitation, I think, that, that I needed in some sense to put my hand up. Yeah. So I, I'll roll it. Let me share this again. And we'll keep watching. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so Mike, hi. Thanks for doing Can I say a few yeah. things? Uh, ground rules, okay? So first of all, uh, thank you for doing this. Secondly, you'll find me interrupting you, okay, at times. If I do yeah. so, it's because I think it's helpful to do that. It's not because I'm impatient or I'm bored or, I'm or, or I think you're wrong, okay? None of that. It's just I'm going to move the process along for your benefit, okay? Sure. sure. Thirdly, any question I ask you is an invitation, not a demand. So if I ask you something and you don't feel like answering it, even if, if mid into your answer, midway into your answer, you realize I'm not comfortable talking about this, you just stop, you just say so. Okay. But until you do say so, I'm going to assume that it's okay with you. Is that fair enough? And the final, thing, the final thing I'll say is, I don't know what problem you're going to present me with, but I really have no idea whether I can help you at all. It's an experiment, right? As long as you're willing to be 
part of an experiment. I am, but maybe I'll maybe I'll come out of it looking totally incompetent. I don't know. Give it a chance. <laughs> okay. So, what would you like to talk about? Sure. Um, I guess just to preface what you were saying, I've this is a bit of an indulgement for me because I have done a lot of these type of things, but it's I always love doing them again uh, or more and specifically i read stop recently right listened to oh, sorry, stop right there please yeah one of the things i do in compassion inquiries i pay attention to people's language okay now if i was working with melissa or david or alexander or anybody else would you say to them or you indulging yourself? No. But notice you said it to yourself. Yes. Which means that there's an element of lack of compassion for the self. Notice that? Yes. Even as you're asking your help for help, you're kind of excusing yourself. Okay? I'm kind of what? Sorry? Excusing yourself or or, or Yes, or, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Well, let's just notice that nothing wrong with that I'm, this is not to make you wrong it's just an automatic tendency that you might notice in yourself okay all right Definitely. fair enough thank you please carry on no, I appreciate it. Positive. yeah i'm never no matter how much help i get i'm still not worthy of getting it um there we go i just wanted that sentence to roll out it is actually it's a profound line um I just wanted to back up a tiny bit. I want to go through that little segment, if this is okay with okay. you. Um, of course. So, so um, his introduction of ground rules, um, and, he, and he has, he says three, it's actually two of them. He's thanking you, and yeah. then he says, he's going to interrupt you on purpose to probe certain words you use, in this case, indulgence, um, in, yeah. in your case. Um, and the second is, he's going to assume you're going to be comfortable with answering his questions, unless you say no, which is an interesting view of consent, right? Because often we say, are you cool with something first? So you, you give your approval as opposed to waiting for someone to say no. Um, in your practice as a therapist, um, is what Gabor Mate did standard? Is there sort of like a norm around um, laying out how you operate like when you work with with different people who come to you do you sort of say this is my style these are sort of like my the things i'm i'm working from uh these are my ground rules are you cool with that is that something you also do with your with the people you work with yeah so the first piece is just to recognize the uncommon situation that this happened in Right. Again, he's doing a talk to a hundred random people from around the world. He has one minute to preface a psychotherapeutic interaction with someone he's never met before. And so in that sense, I think he did a really good job. And so I would say, so just that piece, the context of how this all transpired is important. Then to answer your specific question, yes, I'd say in most therapeutic interactions, one informed consent is the most important thing, mm -hmm. uh, which you, it was interesting to hear you say that that's an interesting for, uh, form of consent. I can't remember the exact word you used. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think it is important to preface how you work and, and just to, the idea in these interactions, I think most commonly is that the person who is there seeking guidance or support is always the one in control. So the, the therapist's job is never, well, is to be very careful when treading through sensitive experience because subconsciously and typically most people, I think what, helped this interaction be so so powerful and everyone in the group so kind of moved by it and they shared that 
was because I have so much experience in these situations. And because of that, we were able to get to the point so quickly and, and, and it was sort of that helped it be open. So, so that's the sort of answer is just, we're always respecting the individual's autonomy over how they're treated and how they're guided. Right. And that's really important because oftentimes that probably doesn't happen as much as it should. And then people shut down and then it's over. Then you have no chance, right? Right. So it's really about building trust and safety. Right. Um, that's really interesting. That I mean, his approach made a lot of sense. I was I was intrigued by the 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 consent because it was sort of like you know you think about it in a sexual context that form of consent is to, it would not be considered appropriate anymore. Assuming yes until someone says no. Often it's the right. other way. Are you okay with this? Are you okay with that? Um, so I guess in, in in his mode, he was like, I'm going to push you and I'm going to ask you questions until you tell me to stop. Yeah. Um, so maybe in that, in this therapeutic context, it would work in other contexts. Um, that might be an inappropriate form of consent, but I thought that was just, that, that was interesting. Um, okay. So then you go on to make an interesting point. And I will admit, I think for audio reasons, um, I don't fully understand where you're, what, what you're saying regarding uh, indulgence. So I, I wanted you to explain it to, to us in the audience. Um, and then I don't fully understand his critique of it or where he's trying to bring you back. And I think that's also because of the audio. Um, right. But maybe can you, what do you mean by you felt like you were indulging yourself by volunteering uh, your time to speak to him? Like what, wh where were you coming from? What did you mean? Yeah. Important question. So because I've done so much of this, I'm trying to think of a, ah, and it, as I was thinking about this conversation, these are some of the things that came up about this question, and I'm glad this just came to my mind, is the context. So 90 or 100 strangers, I've never met him before. There's an element of um, vulnerability and fear in some sense. So I think part of my statement was masking the, I hesitate to say like courageous act of volunteering here to give myself extra support for what I was going to bring up to him. So there's that piece of just, I think I said that in a sense of a slight fear or, or desire to kind of preface or protect myself from vulnerability in some sense. And the indulgence is, and I, 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 I paused it right after that comment of, yeah, no matter how much help I get, I'm still not deserving of help. Right. So. And, and that's where he stopped me and just to drew, draw awareness to that. And I thought that was a really good thing that he did. And it was in the moment, of course, my defensive impulse to shy away and to hide, right? And to justify or rationalize why I said that. Mm. But he was absolutely right. It's just, just to notice, okay, here I am with one of the world's leading teachers and I still have to justify the fact that I'm asking or engaging in this interaction so the okay so so when I heard you say indulgence and initially my thing was um it's like a this was like a luxury item that you didn't really need I was like Mike is saying that he this is just sort of like a I'm indulging myself in going to a really fancy resort or eating a certain kind of food that I don't need, but I'm indulging myself. I want it. I don't need it. Is that where were you saying that? Yeah. You yeah. Didn't or but you're. I think I think you're saying you, one. You didn't need it, but also like I think the real interpretation is you felt like you didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve access. You didn't deserve 
his wisdom. Um, and I think that's what he's pointing to. Is that, am I, am I hearing things correctly? I think it's both of those things. So mm -hmm. one, it's, yes, because I've done so much of this work, there is a part of me that thought, this is something I've already talked through so much, and I'm well aware in some sense of how, right. how to think and work through these things. Right. So that's sort of one piece. And then, yeah, the other piece of not deserving it. Um, mm. Yeah, so those are the two things. And then, of course, just the, the vulnerability and the sensitivity of just opening myself up to all these random people. Right. I think that must have played a little bit of it. Right. Um, okay, before we move on to another, the next yeah. clip, I just wanted to ask you another thing as a practicing therapist. Um, mm -hmm. he, Gabor Mate says something really interesting that that in your conversation with him, it's, it's, it's an experiment and he might expose himself as incompetent. Um, is in your mind, uh, humility, a bit of insecurity, a bit of sort of that awareness of the extent to which you can help an important characteristic and of, effect, of an effective therapist, like in your practice and in your experience with other therapists, do you find that the most effective are those who are saying to you, like, look, I actually have no idea if I can help you and I'll, I'll do my best, but we'll see how things work over the next hour or so. Like, is that, is that something you yeah. see the most effective therapists? Yeah. I, so I do think there's something, uh, there's a quality to that humility and just the recognition of, I may not be able to help you or, or I, I love the words my teacher Heidi often uses, you know, just as an experiment or let's mm -hmm. just imagine, or as an invitation, there's these sort of open expansive words and ways of being are conducive to openness, right? Are conducive to sincere interaction. And I think that is in direct contrast to that um, assuredness of the hyper-rational evidence-based Western mind, right? And and I think a lot of people in these type of interactions tend to front, right? Or tend to pose, right? <laughs> those, those are kind of words from high school, but pretend that, or, or not pretend, but put out this image that they are the authority and they are going to direct this in the right direction and you should just trust them because they have letters behind their names and degrees and blah 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 um and so i think he yeah his sort of you know he didn't go into any of that he wasn't like i've done this for years and i've you know blah 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 blah, blah. he didn't say any of that he was very i might not be helpful and let's just see what happens um, I don't want to skip ahead too much. I just want to put a pin in one thing. There is, yeah. he does say something later on in the video that um, I thought it was in some ways inconsistent with what he's saying right now, but we'll get there. Um, okay. It was his sort of diagnosis of where your sense of guilt comes from. Yeah. Um, but let, let's, I, I, let's, let's maybe go methodically through things. I just wanted to say maybe... Maybe he was too, maybe there is a moment when he's like, look, I know what you're, I know what, I know what's happening here. Um, so it's easy to be outwardly humble, like, hey, this is an experiment, but in practice, um, that's, a, that's another thing. And I'm, I'm not saying he wasn't at all. I'm just saying there, I think there was a, a point where there was tension between him saying, hey, look, I actually am not really sure what this is going to be for us in the next 10 or so minutes. And then mm -hmm. later on, when he's giving a bit of a diagnosis, a causal explanation for a feeling you have um, in, a, in a way that I, I was surprised. I don't think he's necessarily wrong, but it, was, it sort of took me off guard given how he prefaced or, or introduced his, his approach to you. Yeah, well, I think the other side of that would be 
prior to hearing what I had to say, he said, I may not be able to help you, right? Or I don't know. But then after hearing what I had to say, then right. perhaps he did know, right? Or, or he had an intuition. Um, and again, rem rem remembering this is in the context of a very brief interaction with someone he's never met before. Right. Right. Um, so there's that piece too. Okay, should we keep going? Yeah, let's keep going. Play it? All right. So yeah, I read or I listened to the Scattered Mind recently. And the tiny backstory is I was chronic addict from about 12 to 30, got married, sobered up, had a kid. And as you know, marriages when with one person in recovery tend to be difficult. And so it was pretty difficult for the first five years or so. We have two kids, one of which, and I have a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, I guess it's been almost 10 years since I've been sober, et cetera. But my son has ADHD and he's eight. And so where I struggle, and I've done the mindful self-compassion, a lot of that training is still like a lot of what you said in that book was so relevant in terms of the my own childhood, my wife's childhood, um, and the stress in our home for my son and daughter. That has diminished quite a lot over the past five years or so, but there's still remnants of it. And also, obviously, the first five years of his life were pretty stressful. So I have shame associated to that. I I get into my own catastrophizing of like, oh, I didn't do this. And every time he acts a certain way and I respond with anger or impatience, the catastrophizing goes. And so I think part of it's like self-forgiveness slash being as responsible and attuned to him. I think you use that word a lot, attunement. Um, and so we have, as a family, we've certainly healed and we continue to practice, but yeah, I, I just, that's a gnawing angst inside and uh, there's shame there for sure. Yeah. I got it. And uh, as a parent, I, as you know, from that book, I, I went to the same yeah. thing. And uh, even long after I wrote that book, I continued to carry guilt and self-blame about what I, the experiences that my children had in a home with two very stressed parents sometimes at each other's throats and sometimes not talking to each other at all. Yeah. So I get that. Um, one of my sons and, and I, his name is Daniel, him and I are actually gonna write a book together called Hello Again, A Fresh Start for Adult Children and Their Parents. And uh, that's after we finish this current book. And you might wanna look at YouTube and look us up in this talk that we give together on on that topic. Now, I know your kids are not adults yet, but you just might get something out of it. Okay. Yeah. What's it called? Sorry. Hello again. Just, just, just Google Daniel and Gabor Mate. That's all on YouTube. You'll find it. It's been seen by about 300,000 people. Now, come back to your shame and guilt. So let's agree on something. Had you not had been addicted, had you not been going through a difficult recovery, had you, you, you and your wife had not had significant deep stresses that went back to your childhood and to hers otherwise she wouldn't have been with you so it's not just about you by the way yes totally yeah <laughs> but had that not had happened your children would have an easier time in life let's agree on that okay let's also agree that had all that stuff not happened they wouldn't be facing some of the difficulties that they're facing right now that's true right? absolutely yeah yeah so that is true how do we separate that from the guilt though? So let me ask you this question. How, at what day, I'm gonna ask you a number of questions, okay? Inquiry. The first question is, do you remember the date and the time of the day when you woke up and you decided, I'm gonna screw up my kids? No. You can't remember that date? You have bad memory, what? No, I don't have, uh, yeah, I definitely have a bad memory. <laughs> it's been fried <laughs> to shit. But, <laughs> but you're pretty sure that didn't, that didn't happen, right? Definitely not. 
Bro, you never consciously made a decision, did you? I'm going to screw my kids up. No. I'm going to impose on my kids some of the traumas that I experienced. You didn't make that decision, did you? Well, no, but I have to be honest. There are moments when I have the thought, I want to make this person suffer because of my anger or something like that. I get you know? that. I get yeah, that. Yeah, okay. I yeah. get that. But in terms of a decision to create problems for your kids. No, definitely mm -hmm. not. Number one. Number two, how old are you as a child when your parents decided to work on themselves and to work out their traumas so they wouldn't keep passing it on to you? How old were you when that happened? Still has yet to happen. Okay. But it's happened for your kids, right? Can you realize what a gift you're giving them? Can you realize how wonderful it is for them that they have parents who are seeking to become or who are becoming conscious? So when you catastrophize, all you're doing is you're projecting your own childhood onto your kids. For sure. But, but you're not factoring in that they have different parents. Do you see that? I do. Can you acknowledge yourself for that? Yes. I can't always feel it, but I can sometimes. I'm not asking you to feel anything. I'm just asking. Can you acknowledge yourself for that? Yes. Okay, good. Now I'm going to come to my third question. Can you stop it there? Oh, wait, I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. So this was super, this was incredibly interesting for me. And, and I'm wondering what you're feeling emotionally when Gabor Mate asks you to acknowledge a certain reality. It feels like the first step of AA, just like admit that not only you have a problem, but you've caused problems. Even if you're not doing it intentionally, you have caused problems. You have made, at least according to to what what he's saying you've made the life of your your children and your wife harder just by virtue of what you've experienced in life um and he's asking you to accept and acknowledge that um how did and i and mike i, I know you've confronted this for years um may, maybe that point or, or or points related to it but how did you feel in that in that in that moment is is this something you're you're used to comfortable with acknowledging it is it always uncomfortable and brings up more guilt um what were you thinking about when you when you when you heard him say that uh, yeah i think i would just reframe it a bit as he was asking me to recognize that i had very little control over how i was raised and therefore, we pass on our own traumas unconsciously until we become conscious. Right. Um, and so I think it was, it was quite, it was a nice reminder of this is the way things are, right? So I think he was doing a great job of just acknowledging this is the reality of existence and we pass these things on we come with our own whatnot and and just to accept or recognize that that's the way things are yeah but hold on then, sorry. But yeah the question yeah. is how did you when you hear that when you're asked to accept that how did you feel oh i that part to me is now elementary where I did get emotional and even now listening was when he said, you know, it just, can you, can you see what a gift it is that you're giving to your kids? Yeah. And in the moment then too, I almost teared up and it looks like he was tearing up too. Um, because that is the gift. That's, that's the beauty of, working on your or, or like opening up to your pain and, and and healing it and that kind of stuff right and so that was 
I did. I remember at the time I got welled up with emotion and, and that's the reminder. And that's sort of the antidote to the dwelling and the catastrophizing mm -hmm. because that's the ego or whatever the, the part of us that want us to suffer through self-criticism that will never end. And so to interrupt it, we have to acknowledge that it's there and that it's caused us pain and suffering in others. And then to start counterbalancing that with the consistent actions in the present that move us in a different direction. And so that, because that for me, that was so difficult or took so long to start that process. It was so healing and freeing mm -hmm. and it still carries so much like emotional intensity of like joyous intensity that yeah it was just nice to hear him point it out so i think that answers the question of like the first part of acknowledging how my past and whatnot caused suffering mm -hmm. to me is sort of just the way things are um, but yeah maybe at one point in my life for sure i probably would have been pretty defensive about that right right that makes sense. Yep, that does make sense. Um, maybe one more point, and then we will go back to the to the video. Um, just to build on what you were saying about the gift that you're passing on um, to your children, and as I was listening to him, um, it made me think of this. Uh, you know, we often think about like intergenerational wealth, like parents passing their own resources onto their kids. We don't often talk, we don't, or at least I don't often see it, um, the passing down of intergenerational trauma. And what he is saying to you is you're actually acting as that, like, you're blocking the transmission. Like I had a vision in my mind of like a virus being passed on. Mm -hmm. um, so it's circulating within the, the Stroh family, right? Mm -hmm. And you're saying, no, you know what? It's not going, I'm not, I'm not going to be a host of that virus anymore by virtue of working on your own sort of emotional immune system. So you're stopping the transmission of intergenerational trauma that at least in the story that we're hearing today is, is being passed down from your parents to you and then potentially from you to your, to your own children. And by working on yourself, by speaking, by doing starts with me work and everything related to that, by speaking to Gabor Matz and have the courage to share your story, you're blocking that the transmission of that trauma onto the next generation. So I thought that was actually a really interesting point, especially in the context of the pandemic, when we're talking about the transmission of things and, and things that are dangerous. So it sounds like you're playing your part in, in, in curbing the spread uh, of, of trauma. Yeah, and I think that's such a valid, we, it, it, it's gonna, we have, evolutionary drama no doubt humans have been killing and slaughtering and we've lived you know life is hard there's yeah. that piece and then yeah there's the specific family stuff and of course you know my our kids will carry their own traumas and etc from us but yeah we are certainly when you can wake up to it and recognize it it does put a a dam in there or it starts to that healing process starts mm -hmm. And then my kids have the opportunity to, to continue it. Right. Um, and that's important, of course. And, and for our world, if we add the societal context to it, for all the activists out there, or the people who want things to be different, it, it, it can't, I think I get more and more stubborn about this every day. It can't happen outside we have to change internally and mm. if we change internally then externally things change mm. so if we want there's a there's a, a sentence in a this is a reflection on the bhagavad gita and i'm just going to read it here quickly uh, it was sent to me the other day by someone who's i guess i'm helping along uh the bottom line is that man cannot influence the outer world before they change themselves. By changing themselves, 
themselves, they change the outside world in the best possible way. In fact, they can only change themselves, for that is the only freedom they have. In the outer world, everything is conditioned by the wider context, by astrological and other rules. Therefore, we can have an impact on the outside world only indirectly by means of changing ourselves. Right. Um, actually, let me just read the last sentence. The results are always visible. The more correctly we raise the level of our awareness, the more favorable our life is mm. and vice versa. All the pain and suffering of life stems from human unconsciousness. Boom. And that's what he was also pointing to when he said, are you aware of the gift you're giving mm. your kids as two conscious parents? Right. Practicing becoming conscious. Right. Yeah. Okay. So should we roll tape? Keep going. Yeah. Roll tape. All right. Let me share the screen. Okay. Here we go. When in your life have you not felt guilty, Mike? <laughs> um, maybe in long bouts of meditation, but, uh, or maybe when I'm in the service of others, but generally speaking it's there no i'm gonna make a wild guess here the guilt was yours before your kids yes it has nothing to do with your kids <laughs> uh true enough when we have children and we let them down in some ways some remorse is inevitable but that deep sense of guilt about yourself, you had that long before you even looked at your wife. Never mind your kids, right? Yeah, I mean, that's part of being an addict, no doubt, is, is no, it's that. Not, no, it's not part of being an addict. It's part of being a traumatized child. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> you are guilty because you didn't make you happy, right? Didn't make my parents happy? Children happy. Sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. No, you have some guilt because you didn't make your kids as happy as you could have. Ah, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. No, you. Sorry, I, I wanted to jump in on this one. Yeah. Um, Mike, because so this is where I wanted to put a few moments ago when I was like, he, he's introducing himself as this is an experiment. Um, there's some, hum there's a lot of humility there. And now he, and I, I don't mean to say, I, I should say this, I, I am not a, I, I've, I'm not an expert in any of this. So I'm simply asking questions and it's not meant to be criticism. It's more inquiry. Yeah. Um, he, he seems to, he seems to be now going in a place of identifying the, the cause of your guilt or trauma. And he says specifically, uh, as long as I heard him correctly, um, it's because you didn't make your parents happy. And that just watching this interaction as an outsider, I'm like, wait a second, you barely know my, I'll just try to be as, I'll put my as critical hat as on as possible, just in the sake of, of course, respect, but also just really digging deep into this conversation. Um, he has, he doesn't know about your childhood. He's never met your parents. Um, he hasn't heard your personal story. Um, how can he make this claim? Um, forget whether he's right or not. It's like, what's the evidentiary basis in that moment, given the short interaction you've had with him for saying, oh, you know what, this is where you're, it's not, it doesn't have to do with your kids. It predates your kids. It's because you didn't make your parents happy. Well, in my mind, I'm thinking of a, about a whole, I'm thinking of a whole host of other hypotheses that could explain your guilt. Um, Maybe you murdered someone. I hate to say it like, I mean, but like maybe you stole money from someone and never told anyone. Maybe you would beat your dog, um, something bad. I mean, there's lots of things we all, like you just said before, humans do horrible things um, all the time. Um, consciously, we may reflect on it, but subconsciously we definitely, it definitely does something to us, I think. So 
what's your view? Why did he, why was he able to jump to this conclusion? Did you get your back up? Did you agree with him? Where were you at in, in this moment of the conversation? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first piece is 100%. I agree with the idea that my the guilt I experienced in relationship to my kids has nothing to do with them, for sure. So I may, if I act a certain way towards them, I might feel guilty. And I, I like the definition of guilt being I've done something bad. Yeah. And the definition of shame is I am bad. And guilt, shame and guilt are, can be healthy emotions because they can be corrective. Yes. So, so the, so that's one piece. So hundred percent, and this is in line with his approach. And I would say mine inclination to, towards the more spiritual, whatever philosophical approach to human consciousness is we, whatever we experience in our own realm of consciousness is ours. It's not anyone else's. So when the guilt arises in me, it's more my own interpretation of my reality than it is what I've done in any given situation. Mm. And I may experience the guilt and notice it come and pass and whatnot. And then I can be more clear as to what's going on. But so that's the one thing is, is the guilt predates the kid. That's sort of, sorry that feeling of guilt. And then as he, as you say, sort of contrasts his claim of he may not have know what's happening or he may not help at all mm -hmm. versus, oh, I know what's going on here. Your guilt comes from your bad childhood. Mm -hmm. I'd say part, part of any leader, not self-proclaimed, but he's a sort of a appointed by the public as a leader on a lot of these topics, mm -hmm. he has to make certain claims about human experience, right? To, to develop that philosophical framework. And one of his anchors is all psych, well, most physical illnesses, and this is backed up by lots of data and science and research come from childhood trauma, trauma in general. So I think he's biased towards that, that frame of reference. So that's probably part of why he went there so quickly. But also, I think he also picked up on what I shared earlier on, I read your scattered brain book, I have ADHD, I was an addict. Um, mm all that kind of stuff. So that gives him a sense of most people don't turn out that way when they have healthy childhoods. And of course, that's a, that's an assumption, right? But that's a pretty accurate one. Right. Right. So, so he's my, deducing. Yeah. Yeah. By Go childhood ahead. trauma, what you really mean, I think is, um, uh, a. a a, per, a, a healthy attachment with your parents. That's what he's putting, because trauma could come from different ways. It could come from losing a parent. It could come from yep. witnessing something horrible in your childhood. It just, childhood just refers to a time period, not the cause of the trauma, right? right. Um, right. So in this case, is he, from you talking about your past with addiction, um, he's saying, oh, likely what Mike has experienced is something to do with his parents. This is yes. directly out of like attachment theory in psychology. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and when he said that to you, that didn't. So it got my back up only because I felt like, how does he know? How does he know? And is he putting some framework on Mike that might be accurate, but might also not be? Um, so I think a lot in my own research in political science about how do we come to decisions? How do we use evidence? How do we know what we think is true? Um, so I was wondering if you had had some kind of initial reaction, uh, negative or positive, but it sounds like you that didn't bug you as much when he when he said those things, if I'm hearing you correctly. 
No, I don't think it, it, I think it, the response I had in the moment was, I was, I, I was, and it was difficult to hear, but I think he was 100% accurate in, in one perspective. Yes. So I'm saying, oh, I have all this guilt because I was an addict. Hmm. And because I did so many bad things. And like you said, you know, I had criminal behavior. I've been convicted, you know, as a teen, I was convicted of trafficking drugs. Hmm. And so my frame of reference was, oh yeah, of course I carry all this guilt because look at what a bad person I was. Hmm. And then, and I think quite wisely, he's saying, no, no. That's not where the guilt comes from. Mm. Maybe the guilt is compounded by that, but no, the guilt begins in childhood when we're developing in an environment where uh, I think the consensus a lot is early childhood, healthy, safe attachments. Of course, no one's upbringing is ever perfect, but because I didn't have those with my parents, that is probably where a lot of the guilt comes from, right? Because we're trying to make our parents happy. That's, we don't, we're wired that way, of course. And so then no matter what you do, if your parents aren't happy themselves or have their own issues, of course, you're never going to make them happy because they're not capable of being happy so to speak. So let's go to the tape because at this point you actually make an interesting, yeah. you admit to something. So can you like press play yeah. to build on what you're saying right now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure if I should keep the, okay, here we go. I already answered my question. Who are, the, who, are the first, <laughs> who are the first people you didn't make happy? My mom primarily, but yeah. That's where your guilt comes from because kids take that on themselves. So Thich Nhat Hanh, the spiritual teacher said that the biggest gift we can give our children is our own happiness. Mm -hmm. So you keep working on that, your kids are gonna be just fine. Now, your guilt has nothing to do with your kids. There's some healthy remorse about your kids. That's it, yeah. but that's not good. No. Um, so your guilt predates your children. So whenever you notice that guilt, but guilt, once it, once it becomes ingrained, it'll use anything as further evidence. <laughs> yes. So all your guilt that you've had all your life is doing, that has to do with nothing to do with what you ever did wrong. It's, it has to do with an impossible task that you were given as a kid to make your mother happy. It was totally impossible. It should never have been your job. But you were given that and you took it on because you couldn't help it. And you failed at it. And hence the guilt. And that guilt will now use anything as further evidence to justify its existence. Still can't do it. <laughs> I don't try anymore. I still can't make her happy. I don't try anymore, but yeah. yeah. Well, I just yeah. noticed that the, the feeling of guilt like when you, there's a final question and I'll let you go. Yeah. Sorry, did you want to pause it there or? There, there's so, I mean, this, this exchange is for me, I was like, there, it was, there's so many things to, to probe. Um, and, and in the spirit of Gabor Mate's ground rules, Mike, you do not have to answer this. Um, and you, you can say no. Um, but, and I guess maybe this isn't the purpose of this kind of this, this podcast, but I was just curious why you felt so willing and comfortable to say you didn't make your, your mom happy. Um, did you want to tell us a bit more about what, where that, where that willingness to accept that comes from? Is that through the work you've done over the last few years? Is that a recent thing? Um, was that a new development uh, just that came out of this conversation? Yeah. Yeah, I think the first piece is my adherence to the idea that nobody makes anyone feel a certain way. 
we are in charge of our own mm. domain of experience mm. and that so as a as a fundamental principle that's important it's not, it's not so straightforward of course but just to to respect that as a fundamental principle we are responsible for how we respond and interpret reality and that's tremendously empowering and also a burden mm. so so there's that piece and the reason i say that is because i think about my mom and sometimes i wonder if she was listening to this what she would actually say or think and my mom is very present in my life on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I know that she struggles, or at least I assume that she struggles with contentment, being happy on a daily basis, because she doesn't have, she's, again, I'm making assumptions and sort of projections, but most people who have not had a, some form of awakening or, or growing awareness, consciousness are at the mercy of external validation and having things outside of them determine whether or not they're happy. And if we're stuck in that paradigm, then we're never happy because once we get one thing, then that's not enough. And we have there's an emptiness, a void there. And so it's just the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Right. And, and I know my mom is very much in that, in that frame of reference. Right. Um, and so growing up and, and, and so one, I developed a deep sense of compassion and understanding for her reality. She comes from a family of eight girls. Catholic kids. My grandfather was alcoholic, crazy life, crazy, just grew up in a rural kind of environment and just, so she's carrying all that with no help, no solution, no freedom, no healing. So throughout my life as a kid, I never got, at least from her, very, very little feedback ever that was, I love you, you're doing a great job, good job, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I can, the amount of times she's actually told me that she loves me, you could probably count on two hands. You know, I, I mean, I'm sure maybe as a little, little kid, she probably did, but I don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, and so for her, I know it's incredibly difficult to express emotions like that. Mm -hmm. So, so for sure, that's my reality, uh, or at least what I perceive in my upbringing. So when he said that, it sort of confirmed what I already knew to be true. Um, and it was just another reminder of, even to this day, still so difficult for her to express emotion. She's, she's very, very closed. Um, so, so he was, he was pretty accurate with that. Right. Um, so I just had to, there's two like big questions for me on the table. Um, one so one about external validation and the other about the role of children to parents and how we ought to think about that um yeah so i i for the longest time sort of as i became interested in 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 sort of mental health and and you know my entry point was weirdly enough working with shelter dogs and getting them back on track and um and then also working with students on campus at u of t um I initially was of the mind that, yeah, you know what? It's on us to determine what our emotions are. Um, and it, we have to take a deep res personal responsibility for determining and shaping and influencing how we feel each day. And we have, we do actually have a lot of agency in that regard. And I, and I haven't shifted from that position, but one thing I'm sort of doubting a bit is, um, and this comes from some of the research I'm doing in, in evolutionary psychology and politics for, for courses I've taught, is we're deeply social beings, right? So 
we need we actually need external validation we need our social group to say we love you we validate you we see you you're part of us we'll help protect you um we approve of your behavior it, it's something in, in many ways like I'm, I'm i would say like it's something we actually can't really control the effect and hurt that we can feel when when dealing with exclusion or being pushed aside or being left out. Um, that's, that's something deep, deeply wired into the human psyche for good evolutionary reasons. If we are not part of a group, we cannot survive. Um, we need it. We cannot reproduce if we're not part of a group. We don't have access to mates, right? So there's good reasons for why that need to be part of a group and to be sensitive to external validation is there. So really what my question is, Mike, how do we balance um, the fact that, yes, we should be taking responsibility for our emotions. We should not be blaming others for how we feel. We have agency. We should feel empowered to shape our emotions and, and behaviors each day. While at the same time acknowledging that we're a deeply social species, we need to be part of a group. We're not atoms just floating around. We're, we're connected to everyone we interact with. And often we need those people to say, we see you and we respect you. And in some cases, depending on the relationship, we even may love you. How do you like, how do we balance those out? Maybe it's okay to say, yeah, you, it's reasonable for you to be wanting external validation. That's a normal human thing. And when you don't get it, 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 it hurts. Um, mm -hmm. My question is not clear, but how do you, those seem to be like, how do we deal? How should we think about external validation? Yeah, I think the foundation of that uh, context is yes as as human beings evolutionarily speaking we're wired for social cohesion in our groups and i think evolutionary psychology is somewhat of a newer domain maybe in the last 25 50 years whatever I'm not totally sure, but anyway, I, I know there's emerging or a lot of talk around, we evolved to live in groups of maximum 200 people or something like that. Yeah. And, and where I think this gets difficult is we don't exist in that world anymore. It's never going to happen again, mm. or at least almost impossible to imagine that us going back to anything remotely like that. So we have these conditioned brains and ways of relating to reality. And now we live in a world that's not like that anymore. And there's a huge clash going on. And, and this is probably part of our evolution. Our brains are probably trying to figure out how to adapt to a new world, mm -hmm. which probably is causing a lot of this suffering. Yeah. And so that's one piece. And then the next piece I would say is, I think as kids, as we're developing, we definitely do need that external validation. We do need those relationships mm -hmm. and we aren't, we shouldn't be expected to be uh, responsible for our emotions in that context, right? It, it's sort of, we want to be helping kids get to that Point, but for sure they're there and there's an idea of interpersonal neurobiology dan siegel is big on that i don't know too much of the details but kids brains develop in relationship with their parents and their surroundings mm. and so so again as kids no they're they shouldn't be held responsible for how they're feeling and what they're going through and, and some people never wake up and realize that they at some point become responsible or have the capability to be responsible over how they feel. And so there's, you know, that I, I guess that that line in the sand gets crossed at different ages for different people. But at some point, we have to take responsibility for those things. And so then as a parent, I know, or I practice, okay, 
I want my kids to learn that they have the ability to take responsibility for how they feel. Mm -hmm. So when they blame each other or blame me for how they feel, I, those are opportunities where I try to give them the invitation to start thinking, oh, maybe I have agency over how I'm feeling right now. And I don't need to blame my sister, my dad, my mom, whatever, my brother. Um, so it's a, it's a learning that we want to teach kids so that when they become adults, they don't start pointing the finger at everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I think we've done a bad job of that. And I think I had one other thing. Um, so we, we, I think, oh, that was the other piece is, I do think part of this is an evolutionary process of there's a, there's a emergence of some form of consciousness in humans right now that is distinctly perhaps separating us from our hunter gatherer ancestors. I do think there's something there, there has to be something going on there. And so I think we're in the process of this increased consciousness of who we are, what it means to be human and what, all these other things. And I think that is also um, important to think about because people often bring up this sort of, well, we used to be in tribes and we used to care for each other and nobody was left behind and everything was egalitarian and da, 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 da. And, and that may, might be true, but that's not the reality we live in now. Mm. So we can't hold on to that. We need to figure out what that ethos can look like in modern times. Mm. I, I guess that, uh, yeah. just maybe a quick point on, on that is um, we can't replicate ancestral times, but we can look to it for lessons regarding how we ought to live now. So the, like, to, to your point about we for for 99.5 percent of human development we lived in small groups so um about you know in the members of those groups we care deeply about their opinion especially of us right because if they kicked right. us out we were we were dead um so maybe the strategy that comes out of that um is form tight groups and care about the opinions of those that matter to you so external validation is important. Seek it from those that are in your group and that matter to you and distinguish between those that are part of your group and essential to your thriving and your survival and those that are not. Um, I think maybe that's a good way to think about this external validation thing. I think it's, it's in our control uh, to the extent that we can distinguish between whose opinion matters and whose opinion does not matter. Um, the random person on Twitter and Facebook, who's arguing with you or being rude, maybe they don't matter. Your teacher, your parent, your close friends, they're, they matter. So figure out how to get validation from them, um, right? Or their external validation should matter to you. The, the approval from a total stranger um, may, be, may be less important. Um, but either way, maybe that's something we can probe in in, in another podcast. Uh, the, maybe the, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you is um, on, on Gabor Mate's view of the role of the child towards the parents. So he says it's not our responsibility to make our parents happy. Um, I'll just play devil's advocate for one second and Mike, turn it over to you. Um, I'm about to have a, a, have a kid. I am, you know, I'm preparing my finances. I'm preparing my, my life to be turned upside down so this kid can survive and thrive in a difficult environment. Um, you know, shouldn't they at least pay some of that back by, by making their dad happy? Um, am I a horrible person for thinking that they should at least try to make me happy? Um, or maybe not make me happy, contribute in some way to my happiness, which is ultimately under my own control, but facilitate um, the internal sources of my, of my happiness. So more broadly, what is a child's responsibility to a parent? How ought to we, how should we think about that question? Yeah, I, I just want to address one thing. The last thing you said about we, I listened to a podcast recently with Sam Harris and an evolutionary psychologist. It was really interesting. 
And he did mention that idea of, of sort of close inner circle kind of thing where, where, yeah, I think it is important to have validation or, or support from those closest to us. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of two frames to think about that is one, okay, that those relationships are important. We, we, in some sense, need those for our well-being. Mm. And, but the way to go about cultivating those relationships and getting positive reinforcement is through, in some sense, service or being a good part of that group. Right. Right. So we have to, we can't just expect to be treated with all this love and care and attention and validation if we're not also oriented to giving that to others. Mm -hmm. um, as kids, of course, that's not, it shouldn't be an expectation. But so I think people often forget that they, they're also part of that cycle of feedback, right? They have to, we have to be caring for each other in a way that it comes back to us. And then and this is where a lot of pain and suffering comes from is if you are in a family environment where you're just giving and not receiving, mm -hmm. that's painful. And that's where, unfortunately, in our current world, if you can't get that in your inner circle, then you need to find that elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that's where AA is so helpful for people is because we start to develop that sense of community outside of our family of origin. So if you're not getting it in family of origin or circle of origin, that's traumatic and painful. Mm -hmm. And then as an adult, you have the responsibility to find that somewhere else or find it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that in some ways, I think ties into your other question about are kids not responsible for making parents happy or, or contributing to sort of the joy of parents. I'm going to say two things about that. One, and Gabor Mate said it in the thing, Thich Nhat Hanh, the sort of spiritual master who's, I'd say, next in line to the Dalai Lama in the Buddhist traditions, um, says our parents' job is to give our kids joy and happiness or something like that. And I just, I, I'm trying to formulate my thoughts on this is one beef I would I have with the Buddhist traditions and the yogi kind of these traditions is that again that those to live in modern times you can't just exist in a commune in the mountains mm -hmm. and so that orientation I think is deeply wise and helpful and at the same time not sufficient or not not fully sufficient. And this is where the merging of Eastern and Western wisdom traditions, I think will be really helpful for people is to incorporate this more Western approach of doing things in the world and acting and, and sort of engaging with things in society and the let's just pause and take a look and slow down and reflect and, and, and not do. So I, I just, it's not realistic for parents to just say, oh, I just need to make my kids happy or share my joy with them. I, it's just, it's not a full enough explanation of reality. Mm -hmm. So I think as an intention, sure, it's good. Um, and so let's, to this question of our kids making us happy. I think if the thread of what we've been talking about is as we become adults, we develop the autonomy and the responsibility to make ourselves happy or to at least balance ourselves in relationship to what goes on around us. So the way that I've tried to bring that into my own life is even when my kids were tiny little things, I never expected them to give me the emotional response that I thought I deserved. Mm. You, you see a lot of parents that say things like, give me a hug or give me a kiss or come here. Like it, it's sort of this expectation that the kid owes you something. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's very unhealthy. Um, so I never, ever, ever, I mean, I'm sure I've 
not done this 100%, but I never expected my kids to give me a hug. I never expected them to tell me they loved me. And never, none of that shit. I, it was always an invitation. It was always an openness. Can, and I always, even now I say, can I give you a hug? Or can I give you a kiss? Mm-hmm. So I'm all, I'm, I'm, my intention is to help them develop that autonomy and that boundary over, no, this is my space. And you, you can't tell me what to do or think or, or how to feel. So I think by doing that, we let go of our expectation of our kids to make ourselves happy or to fulfill us in some way. And then we invite them to, to act in their own way. And I think that creates the conditions in which they will make us happy. Mm-hmm. I think that's really important. And so, and then I think when we set those conditions, inevitably they behave in ways that do make us happy. Mm-hmm. And then, and then on the other side of that is if they're behaving in ways that are not acceptable to us, because we are the parents and we are in some sense, the leaders or in charge then it's up to us to tell them that whatever they're doing is not acceptable. Mm-hmm. And, and to the best of our ability to do that in a way that's not projecting our guilt or our sense of righteousness or whatever onto them. Mm-hmm. And that's difficult. So for example, you know, when my kids are fighting or when my kids are behaving in a way that I don't like, mm-hmm. when I'm tired when I'm run down and I'm not on my A game quote, so to speak, I do that. And it's normal. It's human. I'm no saint. It's you're making me angry, right? Stop doing that. You're pissing me off. Mm-hmm. You no, know? just shut up, you know, or if you don't stop it, then da, 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 da. And so again, that's, that's human, but but those are the moments in which I'm really trying to be conscious. Okay, I'm angry right now. I'm experienced these things. What do I need to do right now to help my kids learn that this is not okay? And oftentimes I'll just say, I need a timeout. I'm being, I, if I say something right now, it's going to be mean and unhelpful. And so I just remove myself from the situation. Um, so that's my best attempt to answer that. So this is a perfect segue to maybe the last thing we can talk about. Um, Gabor Mate's uh, definition of guilt. And I think there's an interesting relationship between what you were saying and how he defines guilt. And I can't remember if we've shown that part of the clip. No, yeah, let's roll that. I think there's like one minute left. Yeah, okay. I think maybe we... Should we, let's play it and then, yeah. and then we can... I think we yeah. might have to rewind a tiny bit. Sure. Um... As a final question, when you feel the guilt, where in your body do you feel it? Oh, where does it like, back up it's, it's like here. Yeah. yeah. He says, okay, yeah. Still can't do it. <laughs> I don't try anymore. I still can't make her happy. I don't try anymore, but yeah. yeah. Well, I just yeah. noticed that the, f- the feeling of guilt, but when you, f- there's a final question and I'll let you go. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, I think what you're getting at is he was saying that guilt comes from not making my mother happy. Um, no, there's a, there, he has, okay. Um, I'm wondering how to do this. He talks about guilt I think it's in the, I think, I think it was just in the clip before. Um, maybe we won't run it, but for those who are listening, if they want to, they can either see the, the clip themselves on YouTube or just rewind this conversation. He, dis, he defines guilt as a thing apart, a thing with cognitive abilities um, to the extent that it, guilt, looks for evidence to justify ah, yeah. its, its existence, yeah. right? And... Um, What I was wondering about here, and this builds on exactly what you were just saying in regards to regulating your own emotions when it comes to dealing with your kids, is you use the words of, you use like the the first person pronoun, the I, it's me, it's I have to regulate my emotions. What Gabor Mate is saying is guilt is doing something to you. 
Guilt is looking for evidence. Guilt is trying to justify its existence. My initial thought in my mind, and I would love to hear what he would, how he would respond to this is, no, 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 it's not guilt doing that. Mike is doing it. Why not just say to Mike that it's you are looking for evidence to justify your guilt. Guilt has no cognitive capacity. It is an emotion. It has no brain. You give it life, you give it life or you push it aside. So um, I, I was sort of curious how you might respond to that. Um, how should we talk about someone who has an emotion that is lingering? Is Do we give that emotion personal qualities, like a personality and cognition? Or do we say, and as if it's justifying its existence, as if it's surviving independent of you, or instead say, you are giving it, it, it life and you're giving it life by doing X, Y, and Z. And it's on you, it's your job, your responsibility to acknowledge how you're giving it life and to minimize that as much as you possibly can. How, yeah. how would you, uh, as a yeah. therapist and as someone going through thinking about your own guilt, how would you, how would you think through that or how would you respond to it? Yeah, it's so good. So the, I think implicit in, his, in this conversation is the understanding that guilt, emotions, thoughts, et cetera, et cetera, arise in consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so when he says guilt, is looking for any justification for its existence. What I, what I'll speak for him in some sense. I, I'll speak for the philosophy. I'd say is that's just that's the ego. So the ego's associated with right, wrong, good, bad, identification with form, quote unquote. So thoughts are form, emotions are form, experience. So. So the ego is trying to justify its existence through any type of attachment it can find. Mm -hmm. So that's what's going on. And he's right. It's the same with if I have, if I'm a narcissist, then anything I can f get my hands on to, to justify or be evidence of my greatness, I will use that. The same way with self-criticism, anything I can get my hands on to justify me feeling bad about myself, I will attach to that. So there's that piece. And the idea you said before about the boundaries of I taking responsibility, I think Gabor is part of this ethos too, of this idea of non-duality. So I think humans, my, I'm in that camp too. We are not our bodies. We are not our thoughts. We're consciousness, which is this energy of the universe. And out of consciousness arises our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, etc. But there's no I there. There's no me. There's no Mike. There's no. So the the idea of me, myself, mine, is a construct of the egoic mind, the thought process that's identified with an I identity of who Mike is in thought form. Mm -hmm. But that just comes out of consciousness. There's no center point to Mike mm -hmm. in the brain, in consciousness. There's, there's no center point. It just, everything just arises. So as guilt arises in me, because it's grasping for identification with form, right? Or thought or experience, it will try to latch on to anything it can. Right. That makes sense? Yep. That does make okay. sense. And then, yeah. So then as I'm, for my kids to understand, you know, I might say something like, I'm noticing a lot of anger right now, or I'm noticing... I usually just say anger, anger, and I just say it out loud to them, anger, anger, anger. Mm -hmm. And because I'm just trying to help them develop that internal recognition of what's going on inside of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think that was a bit side railed from your question, but somewhat accurate. Yeah. Or somewhat. Yeah. Should we play the rest of this? I think sure. it's over in about a minute. Okay. Percent. Sure. It's like here for sure. Okay. And sometimes. A little bit up here. Okay. 
in our life so to feel into it a little bit now is that possible just, yeah just let it be there and ask yourself this question how familiar is that feeling to you and how far does it go back How familiar it is and how far does it go back and what what answer might come up for you about that part of the answer is it's like the main thing i am familiar with and i don't know how far back it goes but i'm sure it goes pretty far back if i sat with it long enough i'd probably get some clear images and memories yeah I don't mean any specific incident, but can you agree that it goes back before you were children? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Next time it arises, do your kids a favor. Don't make it about them. <laughs> don't make it about them. Okay? They don't want to. They don't want to be the effects of your guilt. No, they do not. Nor do I want them to be the receivers of it. Yeah. Fair enough for now. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, and thanks for the. Rebel Wisdom crew for bringing you here. This is amazing. Thanks. There were. All right. Awesome. Yeah. It's good stuff. I love how we said, don't make it. This is not about your kids. Don't make it about your kids. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that sort of speaks to the theme of what we've been discussing a lot too, right? Is yeah. Um, one last piece I would add is what he asked me to do there at the end. And when I asked my clients to do this as a therapist, and I think just generally speaking, we're not, we don't practice this at all is getting in touch with the body and internal experience. Hmm. There one, there's a great, well, we need to get out of our minds or our thoughts and into our bodies. And that's sort of, there's this mind body disconnection in Western psychology that I think has some work to do, but we, we want to tune into our body. Like we're emotional beings. We're not rational cognitive beings. So we need to be able to feel what our experience is telling us. And by doing that, we have more space and agency to then act in the world and to even think clearly. And so I think, that's a practice I do with a lot of clients is, is just tuning into their bodies and starting to notice what the hell is going on. Right. Well, it's really powerful stuff. So for me and maybe on behalf of the, of the listeners, Mike, thanks for making yourself vulnerable and sharing your story twice, not only in front of 82 strangers, but also then maybe dealing with some of what I hope are probing questions to, to dig a bit deeper into how you're thinking about what you're going through and what your kids are experiencing and things like that. So, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My good friend, man, gentlemen for your time and, and for having this discussion. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, even now I sense in my body, like some, intensity of emotion it's not good or bad it's just there right. uh, but it's good practice yeah i hope people found it helpful and as we are learning to do please comment like subscribe share this with your friends family members whoever you think uh, might find it helpful or interesting and if you ever have any questions or want us to talk about other things please do get in touch with us you can just email hello at startswithme.ca or mike at startswithme.ca or david at startswithme.ca and we'd love to hear from you. So thanks for listening. Bye, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm.